Awesome. All right. Um, welcome all. Welcome to the forum on robotics and control engineering. Uh, my name is Tansel Uslan, and I am an assistant professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering of the University of South Florida, Tampa. Um, at my university, I am also the director of the Laboratory for Autonomy Control Information and Systems. Um, with the support from my university, um, I am very proud today to host Dr. Luca Zakarian from the LAAS CNRS to participate in our live seminar series on control systems through the force. Um, force is dedicated to provide free, high quality outreach events and online seminars to reach broader robotics and control engineering communities around the globe. To support our mission, we periodically invite distinguished lecturers like Dr. Zakarian to give talks on recent research results related to state of the art robotics and control engineering. And as such, the force aims in connecting academicians and government industry researchers, practitioners with each other through cross cutting research and education discussions. And we cordially hope that you will enjoy all the force events and find them valuable to your own research interests. Uh, before I formally introduce uh, Dr. Zakarian, I would like to mention a few words about the WebEx. Uh, during the presentation of Dr. Zakarian, you are all muted. And please ask questions after the presentation. And you can, uh, the best way to do this basically, if using the chat box, if you can send your questions to me, I will read um, your questions to Dr. Zakarian. And uh, uh, also, I would like to mention that session is being recorded uh, to be posted to the YouTube uh, website, like other force uh, events. Uh, once again, I am very proud today to host Dr. Luca Zakarian. Um, he is the director of research at the LAAS CNRS to Los France and associate professor at the University of Toronto, Italy. Uh, Luca's main interests in research include analysis and design of nonlinear and hybrid control systems, modeling and control of mechatronic systems. He served in the organizing committee of the uh, organizing committee and TPC of several I, IEEE and IFAC conferences. He has been a member of the IEEE CSS conference editorial board and an associate editor for systems and control letters in IEEE transactions on automatic control. Uh, he is currently a member of the EU CACB and an associate editor of the IFAC journal Automatica. Uh, and for the European Journal of Control. He was a nominated member of the Board of Governors of the IEEE CSS in 2014, where he is an elected member in 2017 to 2019. He was Student Activities Chair of the IEEE CSS in 2015 and 17, and uh, is currently Associate Editor of Electronic Publications of the IEEE CSS. He was a recipient of the 2001 Hugo Schack Best Paper Award given at the uh, A square, C square. Uh, he is a fellow of the IEEE class of 2016. So for all of you who are here live for the presentation of him, first, I would like to thank Luca for participating in our forum. And uh, Luca, uh, basically, we are ready for your talk whenever you are ready. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Tansel. So I would really like to thank you for inviting me to speak in this forum. And I would like to thank everybody for attending. Um, now, before starting, I would also like to thank many collaborators of mine that I've been developing this work with. Um, it's been an ongoing work for about 20 years. And uh, there's a lot of senior or uh, juniors and even people from industry or applied research centers who contributed to this. Um, <clears throat> facing applications also always uh, inspired good theoretical research. And so I think all of this wouldn't have been possible without the interaction that has been going with all these people. So <clears throat> what I'm going to be talking about today is a, a specific solution to the anti-wind-up problem, which is called model recovery anti-wind-up. And um, there's other solutions, there's other anti-wind-up approaches. But <clears throat> today I'm going to discuss the model recovery one because it has some peculiar features that I would like to convey to you guys. And um, in particular, my, my outline is very simple. I'm going to be looking at uh, a general overview 
the model recovery scheme. And then I'm going to move on to linear applications and nonlinear applications. And, you know, each one of these will have its own peculiar features. So as a motivation, I'm going to start off with uh, some experimental system that I've been looking at at the very beginning of my career, about 20 years ago. And this was a vibration suppression table developed by Newport Corporation in Irvine, California. And the way it works is that the table top here is isolated from the floor through this, you know, through a passive system. There's some passive isolation from some material, but also through some active isolation performed by these legs that you see to the right, uh, which are equipped with sensors measuring the vibration of the table and sending this vibration to the DSP control algorithm in this box, which then controls some piezoelectric actuators acting on these legs. So, and the legs are mounted on the structure, right? So you see here the DSP box. Now the problem was saturation in here, and I'm gonna show you what happens uh, in the sensors and actuator signals in an experimental you know, trace. So you see at the top, uh, the output of the controller, that is the input to the piezos, and then you see the saturation limits. And you see that uh, during normal operation, due to the presence of a linear controller that was designed by the company, it you know, sort of uses about 10% of the range and wiggles around to induce uh, a very you know, desirable vibration pattern where you see that there's essentially about one over a hundred amplitude of the vibration over here as compared to what you see next. So what you see next gives you a feel about the open loop vibration. And so we're talking about 40 dB of isolation, you know, induced by the linear controller. The problem is that at time 23, someone walks close to the table. And the disturbance that is induced in the system causes, you know, large excursions and saturation of the controller, which is never recovered. <clears throat> so that's a typical wind-up problem. So a controller that works well until saturation occurs um, and that, you know, the company is really happy with. So they wouldn't want to give up on that controller, but they would want to find modifications uh, that fix this saturation problem and bring back the controller to a normal operation. So embedded then into the anti-wind-up specification is the goal of preserving the local behavior induced by a pre-specified controller. So if we look at a block diagram of this, that's represented by this scheme. The plant P up here is exactly this, say, linear plant that we've been looking at. So for Newport vibration isolation, it's linear. It's under the action of a saturated input, that's the piezo, and it produces an output, a measurement output Y. And you might be looking at situations where there's a disturbance acting on the system, say the floor vibration, and there's a performance output that you're worried about that's not necessarily Y. And uh, for this plant, uh, Again, a controller has been already designed by the designer and it works very well until saturation is not active. And the goal is to add the, you know, the red guy. So the red guy will be our solution and the red guy will solve the saturation problem with the small signal specification that we call uh, small signal preservation. That is uh, the small signal behavior of the black closed loop uh, is preserved as long as the saturation is not activated. The classical anti-wind-up schemes that you study in books typically take this sat of U signal, they subtract it to the U signal, which is this signal back here, and send it to the filter. Therefore, preserving the local, you know, the local behavior is intrinsic because the input to this, you know, to this red box is zero um, as long as saturation does not occur. The scheme that I'm presenting here, the, the model recovery one, is a bit more sophisticated. So you see this V signal here is a bit sophisticated because it comes into here. 
Now, as long as V is zero when this block, which is a dynamic block, has zero state, and if you initialize this guy at zero, then this small signal preservation property is still there. But it's a bit more tricky, and the reason for this signal will become clear in a second. It gives us great advantages. And in particular, I should tell you that in the modern recovery philosophy, this block uh, uh, is fixed. So it is based on a model of the plot. In particular, the transfer function from this line to this line is exactly the same as the transfer function from side of U to Y. So everything is fixed in here except for signal V. The control is fixed by the designer. The dynamics here is fixed by the dynamics of a model of the plant. And what's interesting, though, is that this, this guy V will stabilize the model. And so will be based on the model of the plant. So everything is here in here is totally independent of the controller C. And that gives us an advantage. Turns out C can be anything. It could be even a nonlinear controller. And the anti-windup action will not change. The anti-windup action is a, a so-called external anti-windup, because as you see, the anti-windup block affects the input of the controller through this signal and affects the input of the plant through this other signal, but doesn't really care about the structure in here. OK, so let me be a little more specific about what's the useful feature of doing this. Feature of doing this. Pardon? OK, so, um, so um, oh, there's some feedback, I see. Feedback, I see. Um, um, so uh, let me turn on my checking. Okay. okay, so, so if we do a state space representation of a like this, for example, that's linear, like this, for example, that's linear then, you know, because of what you know, said about the transfer function, the state space representation of the red block, right? So, and for K in here is A in here, and so on and so forth. Now, graphically, focus on a purple signal. You see that this purple yeah, signal, this purple you know, passes through the plant and goes the same path over the minus sign. The minus so what happens is that the next step, the step, next step of this green signal, from this, green signal from this purple one is zero. So what the controller perceives from the from the green signal is only the linear response. That is the response that would have occurred. If saturation was not there, that's you know coming from this blue loop. Everything else is cancelled out. The controller actually also sees the effect of the disturbance of the real plant, which is additive by linearity. In formulas, what's happening is that when you sum up x a w and x, that is, you compute you compute the dynamics of p plus p hat. Side of u with a minus sign here cancels with side of u with a plus sign here. And you get this nice linear unconstrained green dynamics, you see? So that's what we call the unconstrained dynamics. We could call it linear, but actually never I insisted that the controller be linear. All of this works if the plant is linear. As a matter of fact, when I talk about linear model recovery anti-windup in the first part of my talk, I only need the plant to be linear. And the real challenges don't happen when the controller is non-linear. The nonlinear model recovery empty windup problem, which is a lot harder, occurs when the plant becomes nonlinear. And there's still something we could do, as we, you guys will see later. So I hope that this clarifies that with this scheme, we have the great advantage that the controller is very happy because he receives exactly the input he would have received without saturation. We're tricking him. And in you know, like as a consequence, he will produce exactly the output that he would have produced without saturation. And that's a good thing because that's, you know, like it's, a, it's an output that's well behaved. If we designed well this controller focusing on the linear plant, like, for example, in the vibration isolation case, it works greatly without saturation. Now, the problem, though, is that this green signal is not the real plant output, right? It's the sum of those two. So we need to somehow bring back the plant output to what it should be. And that's the role of function V, of signal V. So let's see how we should look at the scheme to look at the unconstrained response recovery, so to speak. 
Now, of course, if you twist your eyes, the wind up state is the difference between the linear response and the actual response, and the actual right? structurally. And so, it, the wind up filter here is often called the mismatch. Because it stores stores response between the unconstrained one and the real one. The nice feature, the nice feature actually, the second nice feature the second that, feature that the controller is happy the, the second nice feature is that if you drive, you will drive, you will drive response to the actual response. Or vice versa. Actually. Or vice versa. Actually. Actual response to the uncontrolled. And, um, and um, you can do that can do by acting B. And, act and to do that, you should look at the right. That, right. You that, you right. Look at the right. That's how it would look That's like if you would not. So this is the proposed signal. Right. And this is the blue signal. And this is the blue signal. If you look at this nonlinearity, uh, you get shifted separation, you, you add separation. L, L, and you subtract L. L. So, in a sense, K enters the dynamics, the mismatch dynamics, through the saturation. And, um, and that saturation is a bit ugly because it's time varying, but it's not too ugly, as, you know, whatever you add here, you also subtract here. So that gives you like some kind of consistency that allows you to design this function k of a w in a clever way. And I'm not going to get into the details of how to design that in this talk, because that's, say, a bit sophisticated. It's typically a nonlinear problem. But of course, you know, there's a lot of recipes out there to do that. And there's a lot of ideas to do it in uh, contexts where it hasn't been addressed yet. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, pretty much what I wanted to tell you about um, model recovery and wind up and the rest will be like illustrations. I just would like to, you know, emphasize that the basic scheme has been extended and um, uh, there's a few extensions that I would like to emphasize. The first one is that, you know, this plant, uh, this model, the red guy, doesn't need to be the exact model of the plant. As a matter of fact, most of the time, an approximate model is enough. And what will matter in terms of robustness of the scheme with respect to mismatches is the incremental dynamics, that is, the dynamics of the difference of these two. Uh, so if that's well behaved enough, then you know you got robustness of the scheme and everything works. You still recover the uh, unconstrained response. As a matter of fact, driving this guy to zero, no matter what, will recover whatever, you know, like the Y should have been. And um, um, and uh, the other thing is that, you know, perhaps it's interesting to say that uh, in most cases, what's important for this reduced order model is that it still is stabilized by the controller. Because roughly speaking, I mean, the controller is kind of interconnected to the real plant, but the mismatch, you know, provides an interconnection to this model. So the model better be stabilized by the controller. That's a good sanity check when, you know, performing a reduced order model. Now, the other good thing about this scheme is that um, it, can, it can guarantee, it can be generalized to bumpless transfer. Bumpless transfer being the problem of uh, transferring authority from one controller to another, maybe from a manual control to another, or maybe it's just a switch on of a controller. Uh, so from zero to that controller. And, um, you know, roughly speaking, the problem corresponds to the case where this purple signal is not side of you, it's something else. Say the output of another controller. Now, it turns out everything I discussed so far doesn't really matter, you know, what the purple is. It will be canceled out. As, as long as you send the purple both to the plant and to the filter, you will still have this, you know, sort of mismatch response storage, and this filter will still keep the controller well behaved. So um, that bumpless transfer scheme, of course, like then when you interconnect, so when this becomes out of you, essentially V will stabilize the mismatch dynamics, which will correspond to performing a bumpless authority transfer to the controller that you hooked up. 
And that, you know, is a nice feature in a lot of experimental applications where it is uh, sort of dangerous to just switch on a controller, especially if there's, a, say, an ugly and, and you know, um, long transient due to some, you know, integral action in the controller or stuff like that. Now, another extension is that this scheme also applies to rate and curvature saturation, that is saturation on the derivative of u or maybe on the second derivative of u. And the way to do that is not evident from the scheme. You should actually add extra dynamics so that the scheme becomes a bit more convoluted, but the rationale behind it is the same. So there's nice extensions of it. And finally, there are cases when you have an input delay. So that's what we call dead time plans. So when you have an input delay in addition to saturation, a nice feature is that um, for those of you who know Smith predictors for dealing with input delays, um, turns out uh, uh, implementing a Smith predictor without worrying about saturation puts you in the position of being able to implement the moderate anti windup without worrying about the delay. So there's some nice kind of separation there where you can design the two things separately and then put them together. Okay, so that's a bit of the overview of uh, a number of extensions that are not really, I, I, we will partly cover them by illustrating them, but it gives you an idea about what's out there in the literature so far. Okay, so I'm ready to move on uh, to the applications part of my talk, which will illustrate those ideas that I've been talking about. So let me go back to my previous slide. And as you see, the controller output gets berserk because of this, you know, man walking beside the table. And um, if you implement that motor recovery anti-windup with the right tricks and tweaks, what happens is that you know, the controller does saturate, of course, because you have, you know, small signal preservation, but after saturation, it will come back in about four seconds. Now, what's interesting here is to show you guys the green signal. So you guys remember what the green signal was, right? So let me go back to that slide. Sorry, here it is. The green signal is the input of the controller and the controller is tricked by the anti-windup filter so to see the linear plant output. So in that case, you see the linear plant output does not destroy the vibration isolation property. So that's really the transient you would see, uh, so to speak, uh, if, um, if there was no saturation. And of course, this is model-based, so these are, experiment these are experiments, so there will be some mismatches but still, you know, like you get a good behavior for this specific case study. And of course, the plant output, the real one, is the red guy, which, you know, shows that vibration isolation is lost during this first transient. Now, the guys at Newport, at this company where we were, you know, working with Andy Till back then in 98, um, they didn't trust us that much. So what they did, they used a two by four. That's what I call the baseball bat um, test. It wasn't a baseball bat, but it was a two by four, which is a similar thing. And they would hit very hard the leg of the table with that bat to see what happened. And as you may imagine, at the beginning, the, the table would shake like crazy, right? So, and that's what you see here in the red and the green, you know, like what, who knows what happens up there. Uh, there's a shaking of the whole structure for about one second, um, a bit more. But then again, everything comes back to normal, and then the recovery is ensured by the anti windup filter, okay? Because that's, uh, you know, sort of a, a structural property of the closed Okay, so the last thing I wanted to illustrate for this is the bumpless transfer, as I said before. Now, the trick here is how do you turn on the controller? And you see, uh, like if you were to turn on the controller, you would see essentially the green, because, you know, at least until saturation is hit, and the green up here is the output of the controller. But you don't want to send that to the plant directly so what we do is we smoothly transfer from zero to one over say 15 seconds by transferring authority from zero to the controller output. And that gives you know, the plant input in blue, which is a lot more desirable because you know you're not gonna hit saturation. And that you know, will 
give you the red curve at the plant output. So you see how vibration is obtained, isolation is obtained, you know, gradually. Of course, the controller will feel like everything is okay from the very beginning. He's connected to the red, to the green stuff. But, um, you know, you will prevent saturation events that could happen. You see how close this gets, you know, in other experiments, uh, the, the green curve would go well beyond saturation. Okay, so I guess I'm ready to move on to the next uh, example, which uh, uh, is something that I was exposed to when I was visiting Australia uh, a few years later, uh, a few years after working on this vibration isolation table. And this is control of open water channels, that is rivers are broken into pools and there's gates, you know, allowing water to flow from one pool to the other. And there's a severe saturation problem because this is useful in Queensland where there's, you know, strong water problems. So when there's little water, the stream in the pools is very low. And so there's, you know, lower saturation problems. And there, you know, in here there was problems, there were problems also at the startup of the controller. And the challenge here as compared for the, uh, to the previous case is that in the previous example, the plant is exponentially stable. I didn't mention that, but the, you know, you could imagine that the vibration isolation table is, you know, an exponentially stable linear system. Here, the system is like a tank, right? You know, filled up with water and water coming out. So this has essentially poles at the origin. Again, these are linear plants, right? So we can talk about poles. And that's a challenge because um, from a saturated input, uh, it is well known that it was well known that you cannot globally exponentially stabilize a plant, whereas you can globally asymptotically stabilize it, which poses interesting nonlinear challenges. Anyway, the design of V1, or the design of signal V, you know, this K. Uh, this, the red stabilizer is a bit more tricky in that case, but not that much. And these are, you know, the simulation results that you see, you know, based on a, on a validated model. Here, you know, it's a bit tricky because the actual inputs are the heads over the gates, so the amount of water flows over the gates. Um, and the actual input are a nonlinear version of this. But it doesn't matter, it's a nonlinear input transformation. And actually what you really control is the position of the gates. But those are nonlinearly related to, you know, the inputs that enter directly in the linear plant. So it's not a problem. And you can see here the output, which is the height, you know, the water level inside the pool. And there's like three pools in this simulation. Now without anti-windup, when you turn on the controller, you see exactly, you know, like the bad transient that I was talking about. You see here how bad this peak is. So that's the dashed trace. Whereas with anti-windup, the bumpless transfer feature is ensured. And, um, and also, I guess, you know, it's important to see here there are some disturbances coming in, you know, like rain or other things, you know, farmers pulling out water from the river. And you see how bad it gets, you know, with undershoots when you don't use anti-windup, whereas with anti-windup, things work a lot better, okay? And this would be like the inputs that, you know, are sent to the system. These are the gate positions, so the actual physical inputs. And these are the inputs that enter linearly in the dynamics. Okay, so... Now let me move on a bit further into the challenges and I've been talking about say plants with poles uh, at the origin, right? So these are what I could call neutrally stable or marginally stable linear plants. Now what happens if you have exponentially unstable plants? Now an example of that is the tailless uh, advanced fighter aircraft by McDonnell Douglas. Uh, if you look at the linearized longitudinal dynamics, which are, you know, a simple model is a two-dimensional one involving the angle of attack and the pitch rate, you will have a, um, a system matrix A, which has two eigenvalues, a negative one and a positive one. So you could, you know, make a transformation to make it look like this. So XU would be sort of the bad direction, the exponentially unstable one. And also another challenge that, you know, is always there for, uh, you know, aerospace systems for, you know, aircraft control is rate saturation, that is saturation of the derivative of the input. And um, a reasonable 
model for that is the discontinuous model that you see in here. Now, it turns out uh, model recovery anti windup extends to that. And actually, what I'm showing here is a combined magnitude plus rate saturation. Now, let's first focus on magnitude saturation only. Now, what happens with magnitude saturation is that structurally, you can prove, and this was shown in the 80s, that you can never bring back the trajectory to the origin if it is too far in the direction of the exponentially unstable um, eigenvector. So this is the state space, okay? So this is the angle of attack and pitch rate, two-dimensional. Now, if you want to stabilize a point out here, out of the gray, the gray is the so-called null controllability region, there's no way of doing that with saturation. You start exiting and eventually you will go to infinity. So it's not like before, things are harder now, because you cannot just pick a V that depends on XAW. Like even if the mismatch is zero, if XU becomes too large, there's no recovery. And so now V has to be more sophisticated and it has to inject modifications in the plant input, even when XU is too large. And as a matter of fact, I'm showing here two possible behaviors. Uh, that ensure, you know, like non-diverging solutions. One of them is the conservative thing where you limit the reference and it's this dash dot one. But the other one is the one that follows the unconstrained in a sort of anti-windup fashion and then starts modifying things when it approaches too much the boundary of the uncontrollability region. As a matter of fact, the solution slides along a restricted version of that boundary for safety region, reasons, of course. So that's a typical, you know, desirable behavior. Would you want to be conservative like this or would you want to ensure the transient up here? And that's especially relevant for flight control. And I'll, uh, I'll explain why in a sec. Let me also emphasize that when you have rate saturation, then the state space is three-dimensional, of course, because there's the delta state that I showed you before. And so now what's happening is that I'm representing the exponentially unstable direction here and the delta down here. I don't care about the exponentially stable direction because the null controllability region is unbounded in that direction, the gray, the gray band that you saw before. And here it's the same thing, you know, like so the unconstrained could go out here. But then you could either do the common limiting and do you know, this dash dotted curve, or you do the black, which slides along and preserves the solution up to this point. OK, why is it useful to preserve the solution? If you recognize that this guy gives you the pitch rate, ensuring larger pitch rate will ensure that a pilot gets a larger change in pitch in the same time, right, in the same time window. And so if you simulate this model with anti-windup, uh, you know, looking at the pitch rate and the commanded pitch rate by the pilot, uh, and sort of, you imagine the pilot is looking at the angle, that's, you know, his visual feedback from the cockpit, and compares it with something he has in mind, uh, with a simple pilot model, you would want to avoid the so-called pilot-induced oscillations, which are well known to be induced by rate saturations, among other things. So, um, you know, we run a simulation with a step reference of 40 degree, and you immediately see the difference, right? When you do static common limiting, you know, the one that I showed you before, you get a way slower response on the pitch angle than what you get with anti-windup, because the anti-windup will give you the black. Of course, you know, the fastest one is the unconstrained one. As you can see here, the unconstrained one does not respect the magnitude and rate saturation limits. As a matter of fact, in this simulation, all that matters are the rate saturation limits, which is often the case in aerospace systems. Okay, so, so that, you know, uh, wraps up this other application and hopefully clarifies a few aspects related to uh, rate saturation and exponentially unstable modes. Um, now, there's a last thing I would like to emphasize with respect to the initial scheme that I showed you. I told you that you can implement approximate models right in the anti-windup action. And I think a very representative example is speed and heading control for ships. Um, the, the thing that you have at hand is a vessel. Uh, 
which is under the action of, a, of a, you know, two main controllers. Um, the, the speed pilot, which, you know, sort of takes care of the forward speed of the ship, that, of the ship that's you, the forward speed. And then the angle, so the head, heading of the ship, which is, you know, this psi, and it's controlled by the rudder angle, okay? So the typical control systems are, you know, decentralized. And you could do decentralized anti-wind-up for them. And you get really good results when you run simulations. Uh, I mean, if you look at the lower plots, you see, you know, the actuator inputs. And you see how strongly the unconstrained response, that is the, the red one, makes use of inputs be beyond saturations. And the anti-wind-up is saturated, yet, you know, at the output, you pretty much cannot notice any, you know, significant difference. So that's, you know, another interesting feature. Okay, so I guess I can wrap up the linear part of this talk, and we can move on to the nonlinear one. Uh, so let's, you know, once again, look at the cases where P becomes nonlinear. So when P becomes nonlinear, the core idea is still the same. So let me remind, you know, remember, remind you about it. So what you have is that the purple signals will cancel when you compute the sum P plus P hat, right? So uh, same thing can be done for nonlinear, but let me uh, just illustrate a bit more the linear one. Again, let me remind you what the change of coordinates is, right? So these are the equations that I showed before. This is the anti-wind-up mismatch filter. And again, remember that V has to be selected. That's the key ingredient. Uh, and it could be maybe dependent on XU if you have exponentially unstable plants, as we saw, right? So the controller is not a problem. It could be nonlinear. But when you extend this to nonlinear, you pretty much get the same thing. So the plant becomes nonlinear, and the controller is also nonlinear. But the mismatch dynamics, perhaps now it's more evidently a mismatch dynamics. It's a difference, right? And as you see, x plus xaw here is exactly equal to xl, right, by definition. And if you do the math, actually, this immediately gives you again, the green desirable unconstrained dynamics. So the controller is once again very happy with this solution. Now, of course, V now becomes this difficult. So how do you stabilize this, this mismatch dynamics using V in here? It will most likely be a nonlinear version of it, okay? Still, the unconstrained response information is still embedded in this mismatch state which is the key feature of moderate recovery anti wind Now, you know, from a block diagram viewpoint, uh, that's another way to look at it. Just keep in mind that, you know, in the nonlinear case, if you have a controller, which is sort of an output feedback, uh, the anti wind up dynamics will generally need the state. So, you know, we're still far from being optimal here. Like there's a lot to do. And the V typically would need to access all the information to do something good on the plant. Still, the purple guy is still the purple guy that gets canceled out. Now, recall the green intuition, right? XAW is still the mismatch dynamics. And in most applications looking at nonlinear plants, you will worry about stability looking at X, so at the real state, and you will worry about performance recovery, unconstrained performance recovery, looking at XAW, right? So these two things have to be done uh, in the right way. Like, you know, you should do a little bit of both to get a good performance. Now, let me show you a few, example of the, a few examples of this. One of them is, um, um, you know, uh, robot manipulators or generally speaking, oil and Lagrange systems that are fully actuated. So for each degree of freedom, you have an input and you have saturation. And I'm just focusing on an example here, a SCARA robot, the one in the figure here, uh, which is, you know, quite nonlinear in the behavior. And let's, you know, do a feedback linearizing controller. You know, roboticists call this computed torque. The, the, you know, dynamic inversion piece transforms this thing into a linear one, and then you do a PAD controller. Now, of course, with saturation, the saturation will see the nonlinear part of the dynamics. So that's a challenging problem. Uh, but still, you can do something. Like uh, the key here is the design of V, which is clever. 
And I'll just show you the responses to, you know, for you to get a feel about what's going on. So these are the angles, or like, you know, for the third joint, this is like a displacement. And these are the, you know, forces and torques. So for the unconstrained, that's the red one, there's only one little piece of input which is cut out uh, by the saturation. And so when you implement this with saturation and without anti-wind, that's the green curve, you will get, you know, persist persistent oscillations. As a matter of fact, when I was a student, I was in a lab where a guy on a SCARA robot hit saturation um, with a computer torque controller. And the robot broke and never walk, worked again. You know, like it was a huge damage. It was a very loud noise, I tell you. And, um, and when you do anti-wind up, actually, it is reasonable that if you do things right, most of the energy has already reached the plant, right? Like can reach the plant. Uh, and so the recovery should be possible. And indeed, the big problem here is that the controller gets confused. Still, you know, you need some action from the V signal and the blue is what you do. So you see that the difference is almost unnoticeable because there's a very little saturation here. Now, I would like to describe this more by another simulation where I'm having a step going up little by little, and then there's a large step, only on the first joint. Now, because feedback linearizing is completely, you know, gives you a completely decoupled closed loop, everything else stays at zero. But when saturation occurs, you see that the anti wind up action, that's the V signal, becomes, you know, like significant. So we do inject something that comes in, recovers, fades away. And that's really the logic of anti wind up. It should do that. Of course, uh, during that phase, uh, the system will not be decoupled anymore. You see transients here and here, that's reasonable. But still, you know, like this illustrates the idea of, you know, small signal recovery, small signal preservation and unconstrained response recovery. Now, finally, I would like to show you the response that you get uh, when you have a large uh, uh, reference, like this is about 150 degrees and that's huge, right? So um, what's interesting here is to see the fast recovery. Now, the V signal here is a you know, sort of a clever nonlinear selection aimed at performance, you know, aimed at recovering fast. And when you look at a saturated controller, how it behaves, one thing that's always instructive is to look at how much um, the control input uh, exploits the available range when the output arrow is large. Uh, hi, Luca. Can you hear me? While the output hasn't reached the set point and slowly, slowly reaches out. Okay. So here we see that things are quite good. And that's one way to look at it. Okay. So uh, I'm going to skip this slide, uh, which is a further illustration. I'm going to move on to the last application I wanted to discuss. Uh, this is a brake by wire system for motorcycle. And here the plant is nonlinear and corresponds to this block diagram. So you can isolate the nonlinearity down here, and it corresponds to this curve, you know, like it's uh, essentially like some sort of dead zone, right? And these are the experimental points, you know, the blue ones. And again, because of the structure here, that's a second order nonlinear system and the plant, but because of this peculiar structure, you can do much uh, to, you know, get anti wind up. And, uh, you know, without getting too much into the details of the design, I want to show you what you get. Well, first of all, you have a linear controller that is well behaved. And um, the problem is that with saturation, if you only have this linear controller, you will get the purple response. That's experimental response. I'm not showing the unconstrained response because I couldn't get it experimentally, right? Now, with a purple response, uh, uh, this is not good at all. So this system uh, should be um, non-overshooting at all. Otherwise, the driver gets confused uh, and rolls over. 
Okay, so the linear controller itself would induce a very nice and non-overshoot response. But you know, because of you know non-linearity and saturation, you get all this ugly stuff. So the first thing to do is to provide a pre-compensation on you know the linear controller, which transforms it into a non-linear one, and which essentially compensates for the dead zone action. Turns out when the controller is aware of the dead zone, so to speak, because of this action, you will get the blue experimental response because the controller is still not aware of saturation. So it even gets worse, right? Well, because like now the controller is more aggressive because it wants to compensate for the dead zone because it knows about it. But because it doesn't know about saturation, things are even worse. And the, the green is what you get when you add anti-wind up. Because when you add anti-wind up, you actually, in the scheme over here to the right, which is essentially the model recovery one, um, this K and C that you see here in this block is actually this you know, red block to the left. You know, it's the linear controller with that some compensation. And so you can see that this is a nice node overshooting response that you get from combining all these ingredients. Now, what I would like to emphasize, coming back to what I said a few slides before, is that uh, for nonlinear plants that are asymptotically stable, like this break-by-wire system, uh, you could apply other stuff that's out there, uh, like some IMC-based anti-wind-up schemes, some nonlinear extensions of the old IMC scheme proposed in the 80s. But um, you see, you would get the black response. So what happens essentially with that scheme is that uh, even though the output is really far from the set point, uh, the input uh, is not exploited. And the reason for that is that, in a sense, the IMC behaves sort of as in open loop. So it's some sort of open loop solution. That's why it only works for asymptotically stable plants. Uh, and because of that, it's awfully slow. And it's definitely not applicable to this problem because you know the driver will get confused by overshoots, but he gets a lot confused by delays as well. OK? OK, so I mean, uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to discuss. There's a few things that I left out. I think it's worth you know saying a few words about each one of them. Uh, we've been looking at image-based visual servoing, where essentially the challenge here, and it's used for, uh, you know, like um, um, plane landing. But the challenge here is that the plant is not exactly known. There's some uncertainty. And because of that, we cannot really apply the model recovery, which is model-based. You can still do something, and you can, you know, rely on some properties of the uncertain, uncertain plant and come up with a solution here. And another solution is, um, is, um, uh, is one that we uh, developed for um, pow power amps that are used in tokamak plasmas control. Um, the coils in tokamak plasmas, they have, you know, like kilo amps flowing in them. And they typically base, you know, they have amplifiers that that are based on T-restores whose minimum current is 600 amps. So, in the low regime, when you want to send some current in the load, which is you know lower than 600, you must introduce a circulating current in the converter. That changes radically the low signal behavior, and then the you know control system that is outside gets confused. And um, the challenge here is to fix the small signal behavior. So the large signal behavior is desirable, but the small signal behavior is not desirable. And that's what's in need of anti-wind-up compensation, but it's sort of a reverse anti-wind-up problem because you know it is the large signal behavior which is desirable. Okay, so that finishes my talk. I have a summary here of uh, of what I talked about with uh, some references. Uh, the references are in my slides. I will send my slides to Tansel. I will post my slides on my website also so that you guys can download them if you want to check out the references. And of course, feel free to drop me an email if anything is needed. And thank you for your attention. I'm ready for questions. Thank you so much, Luca. So, I mean, this problem is pretty interesting to me as well, you know. We are exploring uh, adapt with adaptive control uh, how we can get less conservative solutions uh, with anti-wind-up. 
uh, and, and yeah, and you know, uh, I mean, for the last uh, several years, I was aware of your papers, and uh, and this was a very informative talk, uh, summarizing not only the linear and nonlinear, uh, you know, model recovery on the wind up, but also applications are also impressive. Thanks a lot. And um, um, now, uh, from the audience, if you have any questions, uh, you know, uh, there are again two ways. Uh, the best way if to ask questions, you can unmute yourself. And uh, sorry, you can use the chat box. Then I can read your question to uh, Dr. Zakarian. Or of course, you know, you can uh, unmute yourselves. Uh, in the past, this didn't uh, lead to any chaos. But um, and look at this. At the same time, I would like to say usually uh, the uh, online audience is sometimes uh, prefers to send questions through email. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, because this is unlike, you know, face to face kind, kind of a discussion and uh, the session is being recorded. So, um, uh, and as you know, as you mentioned, you know, uh, everyone, you can find uh, Dr. Zakarian's, you know, uh, email and address information, everything from his website. Simply go to Google, uh, sure. type Luca Zakarian, and, uh, and um, all right. So, um, uh, Luca, so uh, if if you wish, you know, uh, they can directly send the uh, email. Is it okay? Yeah, sure. Perfect, perfect. And uh, once again, uh, thanks a lot for your time. Thanks about. Uh, thanks a lot for accepting my invitation. And uh, and right now, you know, we are, you know, I we are going to post uh, all the talks from the, you know, this semester, uh, to the YouTube website. And hopefully, uh, in a short amount of time, we are going to link this with IEEE CSS videos. Okay. Um, um, and thanks so much. Thanks to you. So Tansel, do you want me to send, to send you my slides? Do you need that? I, I will still be posting them on my website. I guess the only advantage is that, you know, references will be there. So I haven't browsed through the references, but, uh, you know, I guess, you know, people can go and download them from my website and that's going to be enough. Oh, that, that will be great. So, uh, that will be great. Sure. You know, uh, and usually I post videos and, uh, sometimes, you know, if the slides are available, I would like to post both videos and the slides. So it would be great okay. if you can, you know, email the slides, then I can post both of them together. Okay. So I'll email them to you right away and, you know, then you can put them over there as well. They will be on my website as well. So, you know, people will be able to find them. I'm sure that's going to be easy for them. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, yeah. thanks again, Luca, and thanks uh, a lot for all the participants. So we'll continue with uh, uh, next semester with uh, different seminars uh, covering uh, different uh, controls topics. And uh, thanks a lot. Thanks to you. I hope to see you at CDC in Nice. Yes, we, I will be there. Hope to see you there. Okay, sure. All right. I'll take bye. Care. Bye. 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 bye.